Hello and welcome to worship at King of Glory Lutheran Church in Boise, Idaho. Thank you for joining our online service today on the seventh Sunday after Easter, of Easter. Power. What is power for? Today our psalmist will say, sing to God, sing praises to God's name. Exalt the one who rides the clouds. I am is that name. Rejoice before God. The presence of God is power. Today our psalmist imagines the presence of God like a powerful storm. God riding the clouds, pouring down rain and fire, even fire. The earth quaked, the skies poured down rain, he says. God's enemies melt like wax before the fire. And everything wicked perishes at the presence of God. Don't you wish you could do that? Pour down fire, drive away all this evil, clean away this virus and everything that's changed, restore us, fix this mess with a wave of your hand, take us back to the way it was. Funny, funny I think, how this coronavirus has united us, all of us, left and right, friend and enemy together, from one end of the world to the other, united us in one common experience, a feeling so deep in our bones we can hardly feel it at all, even as it drives everything we do. Anxiety, the feeling of helplessness. When you have nothing to throw at this threat, you cannot even see and yet disrupts everything around you. Powerless. When life is uncertain, when we are powerless, we will do anything to feel powerful, to feel like we have some agency, even if we don't. Uncertainty is a kind of fear. You don't feel afraid. You, don't, you just act afraid without even realizing what you're feeling. It's involuntary. It's automatic for all of us right now. Psychologists call that the intolerance of uncertainty. You can handle a little uncertainty in your life, maybe even a lot, and, but sooner or later, we all reach that point where we've had enough. We're ready for it to be over. That's it, we're done. We've reached our intolerance for uncertainty. And then uncertainty leads us to look for something that we can control. Somewhere where we can feel powerful again, even if we're not. It might be social distance, or a mask, or cleaning and sanitizing, or not cleaning and sanitizing or wearing a mask because you can't make me. Control. Power. What is power for? The presence of God, the psalmist says, the presence of God over and over, the awesome power of this sometimes terrifying, volatile, always uncertain presence of God. And yet the psalmist rejoices because this is what real power looks like. This is what power is for. In the presence of God, there is a place for orphans and widows. There's a home for the isolated and the solitary. There is freedom for prisoners. There is provision for the poor. In other words, for the most vulnerable among us. Because God knows the only just use of power is to serve others. We will hear a lot of power today. All our Bible readings will speak of it and speak of humility and suffering and truth and waiting for Christ to make us all one. Let's begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, 
who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In Christ, we have been set free from our sins so that we might live for righteousness. Almighty God, guard and lead you that you may have life and have life abundantly. Amen. Rise, O sun of righteousness, with your might creation bless. Shine upon your church today, showing all your gentle way. Have mercy, Lord. Rouse our hearts from slumber deep. May your word within us sleep. Give us voices to proclaim praises to your holy name. Have mercy, Lord. Gather in your scattered flock. Give us water from the rock. Bless the unity we share. In our shepherd's loving care, have mercy, Lord. Burst the bars of stubborn pride. Make the heavenly pathway wide. Raise us up from sin and death. With your spirit's living breath, have mercy, Lord. Honor. gracious will be done. Make us one as you are one. Have mercy, Lord. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ, have mercy.
Also with you. Let us pray. O oh God of glory, your Son Jesus Christ suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy, that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading as written in Acts, the first chapter, verses 6 through 14. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Song. 
for God is ever near us. Let our praise be loud and long. God, in your goodness, you have made a home. You have made a home for the poor. A parent to the orphan, the strong defender. This is how our God is, both terrible and tender. With mercy for the lowly, God builds for them a home to lead them into freedom in a land to call their own. thirsty nation, you rain refreshing rain, and when your own were starving, you gave them life again. So where there once was nothing, a nation formed and grew, a home at last, a country vast, the poor received from you. God, in your goodness, you have made a home. You have made a home for the poor. A reading from First Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory, which is the Spirit of God, is resting in you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. and. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Gospel for this seventh Sunday of Easter is from John, the 14th chapter. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. 
They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. There is an old saying among pastors and theologians, the only thing two theologians can agree on is the error of a third. These days, you might as well say the same thing about two politicians or two churches or two religions or two political parties or two pastors or two senators or two Christians or two whatever. All they can agree on is the error of a third. When I find myself in the position of one of those two tis tisking theologians, and especially when I find myself on the outside, in the position of that third theologian so full of errors, I call to mind the lovely old Scottish prayer that goes like this. O oh Lord, grant that we may always be completely right, for you know we shall surely never change our minds. Amen. Well, today, Jesus is praying for you, but he does not pray that prayer. He does not pray that you and I may always be right. He prays that you and I and everyone who calls out his name may be one. Jesus is describing his purpose in life. Father, the hour has come, he says, glorify your son so that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people. Now there's something, authority over all people. Jesus has all authority over your life. You don't, he does. The power, the right to do with your life whatever he wants to do. So I guess it's pretty important then to know what he plans to do with your life. You have given me authority over all people, Jesus says to give eternal life to all whom you have given to me. There it is. That's Jesus' purpose in life. He has power. He has authority so that he can give you eternal life. He lives for it. He does not live to make you rich or prosperous or even to make you happy or to make life easy for you. He lives to give you eternal life a life of eternal quality, of endless worth. What does that look like? Well, this is life. This is eternal life, Jesus says, that, you may, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So a life of eternal quality is a life of knowing God. Jesus is praying for you, but it's important to realize what Jesus does not pray for. Jesus does not say, and this is eternal life, that they may always be completely right. Or this is eternal life, that they may attain moral perfection. No, this is eternal life, that they may know the only true God. Now, when the Bible talks about knowing someone, it means a lot more than just knowing something about them. 
to know God, it's not just to learn a bunch of theological facts about God or have all your questions answered about who God is and what God is like and what God wants for you. Knowing, knowing is, for instance, the word that the Bible often uses for sexual relationships with another person. To know someone is to have an intimate relationship with them. Not necessarily to understand everything about them, but to know them intimately all the same. A husband might have a very intimate relationship with his wife and still not understand everything about her. She will still surprise him now and then. But he's likely to trust the surprises, maybe even look forward to them. Even the mysteries about her become a wonder to him. Eternal life is entering into an intimate relationship with God, enjoying the endless discovery that faith brings, wrestling with the disruptions of God in our lives, trusting the God who's full of surprises, whose mysteries are a wonder to us. Eternal life is to enter into an intimate relationship with God. It is forever, but it's not just some commodity some real estate in heaven that we inherit someday. It's a lively, challenging, mysterious, endlessly life-changing relationship. It's also an eternal relationship with everyone watching this service. Not to mention all those who wouldn't dream of watching this service. Everyone whom God gave Jesus from the world. Maybe you thought it was you who gave yourself to Jesus. Turns out you didn't belong to you and you can't give what doesn't belong to you. You belong all along to God. And it was God who gave you your heart and soul, gave your heart and soul to Jesus. Take some comfort in that. Eternal life then doesn't depend on what you have to give to God, but on what God has to give to you. It's not your grip on life that's important. It's God's grip on you. That's what makes your relationship with God eternal. It's also what makes your relationship with the rest of us God-possessed people eternal. I think I'm okay with being one with Jesus for all eternity, but I must confess, I'm not so comfortable with being one with you for all eternity. Oh, most of you are nice enough, but I've got to say there are a lot of people out there who really get on my nerves. And most of the ones who really get on my nerves are Christians. They say things I would never say. I disagree with them vehemently sometimes. I think they're wrong. And it really bugs me that they can't see that I am right. I'm so right. Do I really have to spend an eternity with these people? They don't agree with me. How can we be one like Jesus says we are? There are Christians out there that, who say that I am not one with them because I don't see things the way they see them. There are certainly, they are certain that they know the mind of God, that they know how to interpret Scripture, that God has revealed the truth to them plain as day. And I am equally certain that they do not know the mind of God. If they are sure they are right, I am sure they are wrong. And therefore, they say they can't be in the same church as me. They can't worship with me or pray with me. They can't belong to the same Christian organizations I belong to. They can't even hang out with me for fear that someone will see them and conclude that they, don't, they condone what I believe. But Jesus looks at them and me, and you, and says we are all his. And we have all been given his word. And we all treasure it in our hearts. And we are all one. All mine are yours, Jesus says, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. Once again, it's important 
to notice, notice what Jesus does not pray for. Jesus does not pray, may they be one if they want to, or if they think it would be nice, or if it would make them happy, or if they think they'd be better off that way. Jesus does not pray, may they be mostly one. May they be one with people they like, people like them, people who already agree with them. May they be one, unless they're not. Jesus does not pray that. Jesus does not pray, Holy Father, let them decide whom they will be one with and whom they won't. May they be one with the ones who are willing to be like them and all the rest of them go to hell. No, he prayed so that they may be one as we are one, because that's the way it is, like it or not. Maybe we're not one, but that judgment doesn't seem to be up to us. So it's probably safer to assume we are one, or at the very least, safer to treat others as though they were and listen to others as we would to those who are and respect and certainly to love them as though they were the ones who were one with God. That won't do much for our pride, but that doesn't seem to be very important to Jesus either. In fact, in today's second reading, Peter, who had plenty of disagreements with other Christians, seemed to suggest that the better course of action is to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and let God worry about who's right and who's wrong. And it's hard to be humble when you're so sure you are right. So unity in Christ must be more than agreement in Christ. Someone has said you cannot be right and married at the same time. Unity in a marriage means a lot more than just agreement. In fact, if you've managed to reach anything like agreement in your marriage, it's probably because you first decided to commit to being united. Unity precedes agreement. Unity doesn't come out of our essential agreement with each other. Agreement comes out of our essential God-declared unity. So unity must be more than doctrinal conformity or political identity. Oneness in Christ must not be determined by our stance on homosexuality or abortion or social security or universal health care or the national budget or the war in wars around the world or the president or pandemic stages to open up America or tax cuts or tax increases. Christian unity doesn't have anything to do with affiliation with a political party or even with a, a particular denomination. It's not determined by who agrees with you about social action or moral behavior or who lives the way you think they ought to live. Christian unity is determined by God who says we are one in spite of ourselves. If we are to be one, as Jesus says we are, it'll take more than being right. It will take some of the other things that Jesus told us to do. It will take loving one another, speaking the truth to one another in love which in itself would be a pointless exercise unless we were first willing to listen to one another in love. We'll have to decide that winning the argument isn't as important as understanding each other. And if Jesus can pray for us and pray for them at the same time, then surely it's time for us to pray together for each other. If Jesus hadn't prayed this prayer, then we could relax in our differences and just call it diversity. Or we could decry our differences and insist on our righteousness and call it purity. We could hate our enemies without praying for them. We could call them idiots and jerks and self-righteous snobs for not seeing things our way. We could insist that we are right and they are wrong. 
But Jesus did pray that we are that we be one. Our one must be one. So instead now, we must love our enemies and call them our dearest brothers and sisters. And when we don't love them or they don't love us, we must practice forgiveness and pray for each other. We must ask God to protect them as Jesus did. We must assume as Jesus did that all that is mine is yours and all that is yours is mine and Christ abides in them and you can see his glory in them if you look closely enough. If you're willing to look as closely as they have to look to find it in you. We must assume that if eternal life means an intimate relationship with our Father God, then it also means an intimate relationship with all of God's children and all of God's beloved creatures. Not necessarily understanding everything about them, but to know them intimately, all the same, and to find a way by God to enjoy wrestling with them, to wonder at the mystery of God in them and in us, and at the lively, endlessly challenging relationship we share with them in Jesus Christ. Amen. Son of God, eternal Savior, source of life and truth and grace, Word made flesh, whose birth among us hallows all our human race. You, our head, who throned in glory, for your own will ever plead. Fill us with your love and pity, heal our wrong and help our need. As you, Lord, have lived for invite you to join with me now as we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, 
God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. O oh God, call your people to be one as you are one. Unite your church in the truth of your gospel, the love of our neighbor, and the call to proclaim your reign to all people as we await the power of the Spirit to come upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Breathe life into your creation. Guide your people as we explore the mysteries of the universe. We pray for the work of scientists and mathematicians whose skill enriches our understanding for those researching and testing vaccines and developing new treatments, not only to address COVID-19, but all diseases that endanger the life you desire for your beloved children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your justice known among the nations of the earth. Protect the vulnerable, especially where the coronavirus has hit hardest, Ecuador, New York City, Brazil, and so many other places. In Illinois and Michigan, and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, Sri Lanka, and wherever the skies have poured down rain, in your goodness, make provision for the poor. Redirect those who use violence and greed as weapons. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Come to the aid of your children. We pray for those engulfed in grief, those without supportive families, for all who are isolated, powerless, or afraid, that all may rest their anxieties in your care. We pray for our own personal care, our physicians, our doctors, dentists, nurses, and lab techs, and healthcare providers who have cared for us and care for others. Protect them from all harm as we now name them before you. Dr. Paul Freeman, Cami from Keystone Health, Lisa, Dr. Bear, Peter Larson, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wisdom and truth, as this traditional school year ends untraditionally, we give thanks for the imagination, curiosity, dreams, and creativity you instill in teachers and students. As they search for ways to celebrate the present, guide our graduates into an exciting new future that their gifts may be a blessing to a new world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage to all who embark on new ventures. We especially remember this day those who risk their lives to serve in our armed forces. Grant safety to those serving at home or abroad and assure them of your never failing strength. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Raise all your saints to eternal life. Until that day, we give you thanks for the faithful examples of those who have listened to your voice and now rest in you. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Gratitude, a friend of mine says, <clears throat> is the way we live out our faith in God. Gratitude. As we come out of this part of the service that is normally our time for collecting and offering our ways of giving thanks to God, I hope you can ponder the ways in which you can be grateful to God and show gratitude to your neighbor. Join us now in a prayer of gratitude. Let us pray. Merciful God, our ordinary gifts seem small for such a celebration, but you make of them an abundance, just as you do with our lives. Feed us again at your table for service in your name, in the strength of the risen Christ. Amen. We lift our voices, we lift our our lives up to you. We are an offering. Lord, use our voices. Lord, use our hands. Lord, use our lives. They are yours. We are an offering. All that we have, all that we are, all that we hope to be, we give We are an offering. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Alleluia. Holy Father, protect them in your name, so that they may be one as we are one. Cast all your anxiety on God, because God cares for you. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? For you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Alleluia. May God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May God look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen.
Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the unity of heart and mind is like to that above. Before our Father's throne we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. From sorrow, toil, and pain, and sin we shall be free, and perfect love and friendship reign throughout eternity. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.